Hi there, everybody. Today we're going to talk about um, some of the advanced features of iBooks Author and getting started with a project that you're doing for science class, just to get you familiar with the workspace and some things that are possibilities for you as you put together your books on your ecology of your backyard. So what I have opened here is Mr. Morrow's finished iBooks Author project as an example that you've probably looked at in iBooks, but it's opened up in iBooks Author. So you can first of all see in our navigation menu over here on the left, the cover of the book is designed in the center of your screen. The title does need to be filled in and it populates in numerous places. So make sure you name your book at top here. If you want to use an intro video that plays when you first go into iBooks and, and uh, open the book off the bookshelf, then you would place it into this space here. The table of contents is actually pretty much designed from the outline that you'll be given, um, but we can talk more about that later and how you program these table of contents pages a little bit more. And the glossary is definitely going to come into play as well as you highlight key terms and then add their definitions into the, the glossary. And the pages are listed underneath this line over here on the left hand side of the sidebar. And you'll notice that some pages are indented and that these little triangles on the left hand side expand and collapse chapters. Now the template that you're going to be working with already has the chapters made, but just so that you remember to expand them to look for the pages within, and then sections of course as well. Um, in this book you'll notice that all the chapters and the sections are titled appropriately. And when you title something, over here on the left, underneath Chapter 1, Backyard Science, it also titles it on the page. So both places come from the same important titling of your file. Widgets and videos um, should play within iBooks Author, so you can test them out, and I'll show you how to drop those in. And um, you'll notice a variety of widgets that are available here for you to choose from to create when you create your book. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the blank template so that we can make um, our sample one kind of look like this finished project. So we're going to work backwards. So I'll minimize this one, switch to the template. Now this template is just that. It's just an empty shell. It does have the six chapters already set aside for you. It does not have a title. So you'll want to make sure that anytime you see lorem ipsum, or untitled that you change it and make it your own. There's even a little bit of text down here at the bottom which might be your names or the date of publication. Just make sure that you get all of those blanks filled in with uh, your personal information. So if we change this book title here, we can change it in, in either place. It's just important that we do change it. Ecology of my backyard and it should change it in both places. Um, the same thing with pictures. When they're coming from the template here, it's, it's kind of important that you use the placeholder and fill it in with your image rather than delete it and then drag your image in. It works better to use the placeholder that's already there because it's probably connected to the table of contents or such. So I'm going to grab an image from uh, my folder of media, which is another really good working point for you is to go ahead and make that folder of images and videos ahead of time. I just entitled my folder Media for iBooks Author. And then you'll have everything ready to drop into iBooks Author. Um, you shouldn't do it in reverse, where you work in the iBooks Author file, then you go find the media to fit it. It's a good idea to collect everything first and then drop it in in the places. So I just drop that into that placeholder. Now if I don't like how it's centered or masked, I can change that. When I click on the image once, I can edit the mask and slide it over so that a different part of the picture shows. Or if I double click on the picture, I can adjust the mask boundaries, the whole image, and edit the mask again. And maybe I want to crop it in a little bit further so that only part of it shows. Um, but again, that's working with the placeholder that was already there rather than putting the image in myself and deleting out the placeholder that already exists. Let's change this down here by Mrs. Morrow, and let's change this up here, 2014. 
So there's my cover. Now I'm ready for my intro media. This one's really super easy. I just grab my video file that I've already recorded, probably exported it out of iMovie. Here's my intro video. Drag and drop it into that space and it should optimize it for me and be ready to play like I said when the reader opens the book for the first time. We're gonna let that run and move on and we'll actually do the table of contents last but just so you know um, because the six chapters are already created here there's already going to be six pages on the table of contents already titled with the chapter titles. Now some things look a little bit um, funky here and we might have to do some editing and if the pictures don't come out exactly right from those chapters then we may have to adjust that later and that's why we're going to save it to the end. But do know it's important to leave what's there already um, intact because of this table of contents. So we'll talk more about that as well as we'll talk more about the glossary later too. Let's move on down to chapter one. So if I expand this chapter I notice it has three sections one on location, one on habitat, one on ecosystem. In the um, the first page here that's out dented, not indented, it has, it's just a title page and it does have a little bit of text and a place for an image. So I can either type in here, uh, my backyard ecosystem will be my farm. It is located or something like that. And I could type it in here or I could copy and paste that text from where I've already written it in pages or on my Google Doc or somewhere else. Um, either one is fine. Just know that you don't want to add the text box necessarily and you don't want to mess with the titles that are already there. Let's put an image in here. Going to my media folder and finding an image that might fit that vertical space there. And then of course I can edit the mask and slide it over to center it differently um, in that space. Okay, and I'm not going to finish the text here because I think you get the idea, but I am going to start with section one. Now, this is a lot of text to type from scratch, so it is best that you do your research ahead of time. You decide how you're going to explain the location of your backyard ecosystem um, and what uh, terminology you're going to incorporate into your, your story text. Um, ahead of time. And if that's the case, then you probably already have it typed up somewhere else and you can just copy and paste. If your copied and paste text is longer than the space that's here, iBooks author will automatically add another page in section one and just continue on with the text. That makes it very nice um, for publishing a book. So that's one of the positive features of typing it outside of iBooks author and then copying and paste it in. I'm just going to open up the finished one to grab some text just to give you this example so I don't know if this matches necessarily and it doesn't look like it might be enough but I'm going to go ahead and copy just this text here switch back over to the one we're working in click on it once to select it all and then paste now this didn't fill it in and make a second page but there's another thing that you can do too let's say that you wanted images that went along with this first paragraph and you didn't want the second paragraph to start until the next page. All you need to do is go up to the insert menu and insert a page break. And what it does is it automatically slides it to the next page. So now you'll notice section one location and it has a space here for me to add a widget or some images. And then when I scroll to the next page, there's the rest of that text. But it is connected, it is linked, and it is um, all still, it's not broken, it's still working in the iBooks author page format. Um, I'm going to also insert a column break and that just moves this paragraph over to the next column. It doesn't put it on a new page, it just puts it on a new column. Um, you can also insert um, section breaks, um, you could put a, a, a picture in here on top of this, a, a widget on, on top of this text and it would push that text down or around, it would wrap around it. So there's all kinds of options there. All right, let's go back to section two. Um, what you don't want to do, again, what not to do, is delete the placeholder text and then add a text box. Even though it might look all right, the book won't function like a book. It'll actually be um, broken apart into non-linking 
um, text boxes and your table of contents won't work and all kinds of things. So don't do that. Just click on it once and then paste your text wherever it is. Let it add additional pages for you or add your page breaks where you want the new pages to start. The same will happen with chapter 2, chapter 3, and on and on. So it's important to see all these sections and what you're going to want to create. Um, here's one that's a little bit different. Section 2 has this kind of um, title heading bar box, I guess, here that's actually a different style of page. Now, you can't change the theme after you've already started a project, unfortunately. It, it's not like Keynote where you can apply a theme later on in a project. Um, but you can change a page layout. So, if I am... There we go, working. I'm just going to pull. If you saw how I did that, I just pulled from the top down. Then I can see different layouts here. And this section has this blue box of text on the first page, where this section doesn't. It's just a different style of a page. So I can change the style of the page in this layouts panel um, with, without, with any, without any problem. Um, but I can't go back to those original um, templates from the template chooser and change them now that I've already started. So I have that white background and this kind of font and this kind of um, text styles, heading styles. And if I really wanted to customize my template, I would actually have to go um, above this line here and I would be working on these pages. For example, if I changed this font color here to red, now every page that used this page layout would have a red title in it. So see how my backyard is now red. Chapter 2, the living environment is red. So that would ha that's how you apply changes to your entire template. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Let me know if it doesn't. Let's slide that back up so we can again see our page navigator. And I think you're pretty good with adding in the text adding in the images, and even adding in widgets. If you found a page where you wanted to drop in a widget, just come up to the widgets button, choose what style of widget. These are all pretty self-explanatory, but you got to make sure that you fill in everything on them. So we're going to do this photo gallery one as an example. Um, it has placeholders for as many photos as you want. So I can go to my folder, and I can actually select a whole bunch of pictures at once if I want. I'll use this one and this one and not that one. I grab a whole bunch of images, drag them back into my um, widget placeholder here. So they're all selected. Use my green plus, drag them in there, and it automatically makes little navigation buttons for all the images. Um, when I click on them, I can now use the arrow to go through all the pictures. But you'll notice that on every single one of those images is the lorem ipsum placeholder text which I have to make sure that I either edit out or delete. So it's going to take some time here to go through all these pictures and clean them up. Now use your inspector, which is this, um, this uh, panel over here on the, the right hand side. You can let it float wherever you want it, turn it off and on to hide it and show it, and go to the very last tab in the inspector. That's the widget inspector. And so everything that I've put into this widget right now shows up in the gallery media. If I click off of it, it disappears. If I click on it and I'm on that last tab, here's all of my images. For each one, I would want to take out this lorem ipsum text here. Um, put a, this, this is for people who maybe are blind and need this screen to read to them. Photo of a squirrel's nest. And then I probably want to go to layout. And oh, I'm sorry, here's an, oh, that's for the whole entire widget. So this is a photo gallery. Okay. and decide if I want the title to show at the top. Maybe I don't want it to show at the top and see how it just takes off that title. Um, or maybe I want to leave it up there, but change it to Photo Gallery of Climate because we're on the climate section. I know these really aren't pictures of climate, but you get what I'm saying here. Um, I could uncheck the caption, and then I wouldn't have any of those showing or if I leave that caption checked for all of the, the photos, then I just have to go through each one and put the label in each one. This is turkey vultures and on and on. OK, 
Okay, rabbit. It's just important to not leave lorem ipsum text and fill in all your information um, before you finish your, your book. Um, you can adjust these two. Maybe you want it to look different. Maybe you want it to be like this. It gives you lots of options here all underneath these two tabs in the last tab of the inspector for um, the widget that you're working on. All right, so that's a photo gallery. That's probably the one you'll use the most often. You don't have to have multiple photos. You could just put one photo in there and all those same things would apply. And it's essentially the same thing with a video. When you drag and drop a video in, you don't even have to open up the widget first. You can just grab a video. Let's do a different one this time. I think there's some other videos in. Here's a video about Habitat. Drag and drop it right onto your page. And it basically puts it in a widget for you. Right, and um, then I would, actually I'm going to move this to the next page. So see how I just drug that to the next page? And my text continued to wrap around it and stayed connected, so that's good. Click on the widget once, go to the widget tab on the inspector, decide what image I want to show for my poster frame. That's the first thing that they'll see before they click play. And then I can also... Um, Go to layout and again decide if I want a title to show or a caption to show or have a background or just have that video floating. And I would definitely fill in the accessibility description, video about habitat, just to give a little explanation. All right, so um, the other widgets that are available that you should probably take advantage of, do a review widget some, at some point where you can build in multiple quiz questions. And the quiz question styles are all listed again in the inspector, in the widget panel of the inspector. Um, and if I add a new question here, you'll see the different question types. Multiple choice, multiple choice with a picture, multiple choice under a picture, multiple choice where you choose from four pictures to answer the question. And you just drag your images in there. Um, also, you could add a question that was drag labels to a target. If you wanted the reader to uh, match labels with the different places on the picture or drag thumbnails to a target and these really make your your iBooks author your iBook very interactive so don't be afraid to test those out try them out get rid of all your lorem ipsum text build your widget and check all of it in the inspector all right so other widgets that are available um, might include this interactive image one if I scroll to another page let's just go to a clean page so we can find some workspace to work with. And if I put in a widget now that is an interactive widget, for this one I'm going to put in one image into the widget. Sorry, there we go. And then I'm going to have labels on them. And these labels are going to zoom in and give me more information when the reader clicks on them. Now you can set all of these points and how far they zoom in. And when you get it exactly how you want it, then you just hit set view. That's the set view for number two, when they click on number two. Now I'll go to number one, and that one looks fine. So I'll leave the set view and go to default, make sure I can see the whole picture, change it if I want to. Uh, maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger or maybe smaller, something like that, and then say set view. And again, you're just programming each of these views. So now when a person comes and uses this widget, they would click on one label and it would zoom into the view you programmed it to and give you additional text, zoom into the other view and give you additional text for that. So you can really explain and narrate and, and teach about your backyard ecosystems with an interactive uh, image is one of those. 3D file coming from um, Google Earth, or Google SketchUp, I'm sorry. Um, but Google Earth is a great option to use as well. You could make a screencast and capture your screen with QuickTime Screen Recorder and then add a Google Earth um, video, per se, to your book. Um, a popover widget. Now, this is a real simple one, too. So for this one, I'll just go ahead and put in a picture of a flower just on the page by itself. So it's not really a gallery of pictures or anything. It's just a, one image. And then there's a B right on side of here. So I'm going to put a, a popover widget on top of the B. And inside of that popover widget, you can put another picture. So this might be a um, piece of text or a screenshot of a keynote slide or something like that. 
oh, let's just use a butterfly or a dragonfly for the heck of it. It's not necessarily a great example here, but you got to put something in that space to make the button. That's what you're kind of doing. So now everything can be resized. So you can make this a button. Pretend this is a button that says click here. And then when the reader clicks on it, they get a pop-up box or a pop-up win window. And here could explain um, the producer on this flower is producing pollen. Okay. So again, it's just like a button that they get to click on and then something happens inside of it. Now what happens inside of it could be text that you type in there or it could be another image. So you could have like a pop-up book when you were little. Um, you click on one thing and another picture pops up. So let's just put another picture in there too just to show you how you do that. Okay, so again, they're here. They click on it and up pops another picture with more information. This could be anything. You wouldn't even, you know, you can move this around, have it be, it could be anywhere, it could say anything. You can be really creative with those. And it's a simple widget with a lot of functionality in iBooks Author. And then if, if you get into um, trying to make your books even more interactive using widgets from another source outside of iBooks Author, that's when you use this HTML widget and you'll actually copy and paste the computer code from the website that made the widget and then place it in there. So I'm not going to talk too much about that right now, but if you're into that and learning how to do that, you'll definitely be using that HTML widget later on. While we're in the inspector here, before we put our finishing touches on, it's, it's also important to click through all of these tabs in the inspector. Um, starting with the first one, which is the information for the whole book. Notice it's blank. And you definitely want to put your name in here, the title, um, any keywords, which would be like search terms that people would use to find your book, um, any kind of a description here about what your book is going to be about. It's kind of like the book summary that you might read on a, a book jacket or the back of a back cover of a book. Um, you can tell, this is important here, where it says disable por portrait orientation. Your book is going to look different if it's held portrait view on the iPad as opposed to horizontal view. See how different it looks? It basically, in portrait view, it makes all of the interactives and the images and the widgets super small and just focuses on the text. Now, if you don't want to program or design that second view, you'd have to go through every page and make sure it looks good in portrait orientation as well. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can just disable portrait orientation here, and now the user won't be able to flip their iPad the other direction and see it that other way. So it's a choice you get to make as the author, and that's where you do it there. Um, the second tab here has to do with columns on a page. If you did want to do a page that had um, different columns of text, and most of these are already set up with two columns, but you could maybe increase it to three, or maybe decrease it down to one. Okay, whoops. And that's for the text on the page. I suppose I needed to be clicked on that text first. Let's go to one that has lorem ipsum text here. Okay, let's add two columns within one is what it's doing here. So it just doubled the number of columns in that space. I don't know if that's something you'll use or not. Um, this is for placing images, either so that the text floats around it or so that it doesn't and you can get into customizing images there and how they're laid out on the page. Your font, your um, colors, and all of your normal formatting tools are in this text tab of the inspector as well as across the top of your screen here. This shouldn't be too different for you to use at all. And then images, you can put on um, certain images if you want them to be inside of a picture frame. Get to one that I actually used here somewhere. Can't even remember where I was. Here we go. We use this picture here. And when we're in this graphic um, tab of the inspector, we can put a picture frame around an image and change the style of it. Okay, and all, lots of options there. Add a shadow to an image. Um, change the opacity of an image if we want it to be kind of see-through. You can do that here, all in this tab of the inspector. 
Um, this one gives us proportions and also helps us rotate. If you want to be a picture to be kind of rotated, you would do it in this ruler tab or the metrics tab of the inspector. This is for tables. This is for graphs and charts. This is for hyperlinks. Now, if I type in a URL here, http colon slash slash google.com, it is going to automatically hyperlink it. But I can also hyperlink something else. So I could put a word here, double click on it, and then enable that as a hyperlink. I can have that hyperlink go to some other thing in the, in the book. Maybe I want them to go to the quiz, re the review widget. Or maybe I want them to go out to another web page. So they'll, the, the reader will know this word will be um, clickable and will do something when they touch it with their finger. So in this case, it'll go out to apple.com. So you can program hyperlinks with the arrow tab. And then we already took a look at the widget tab, which you have to be clicked on a widget in order to see what's underneath of that. All right, so speaking of selecting a word and then programming it to do something, let's go back to the glossary and go to a place where we have some text here. Where did I put it? In my location, right? Yep. Now, any word that you want to add to the glossary, it's very simple. I'm going to take ecosystem. No, I'll take consumers first. Just double click on the word to select it. Control click and say, create glossary term from selection. Now it automatically links it, bolds it, and when I go to my glossary, consumers is listed here. I still have to fill in the definition. I can get that from my computer's dictionary or type it in myself. Um, something that eats something else. Is that good enough, Mr. Morrow? Don't know. But it's programmed into my glossary now so that when the reader comes to that word, they tap on it with their finger and it takes them to the glossary, pops up the definition. It's really slick. So I, I want to do that one more because one, one time more because you're definitely going to want to use that. Let's do producers. Double click on the word to select it. Control click. Go down to create glossary term from selection. Go to my glossary. Type in my definition. There you go. It's pretty simple. So back to our table of contents. Um, I would want to make sure by clicking these little buttons at the bottom of the table of contents that all of my text is readable and all of my pictures came through. If they aren't for some reason, you can move these around, but beware. Because what happens is, sometimes when you change one, it changes all of them. See how all of those titles are kind of linked together? So you have to be careful that it doesn't affect all of them in a negative way. Now, readers aren't going to use the table of contents too much, but you do want it to be usable, um, readable. And so, um, you know, just make some decisions. Like, for example, if I drug this way down here, then on some of them, those sections might not show. They might be shoved off the page. So I want to make sure that it works for all of them. Whatever change I apply to the table of contents works for all the chapter title pages here. Um, likewise, I don't want to add a picture in the table of contents here because it'll impact all of them. But this picture that's here as a placeholder now should be changed when I put my pictures on these pages. Although that one wasn't. So what if I just copy this one with Command C? Go to my, oh yes, it did. See, it did change this one because it pulled it off of that um, chapter one page. And that's what it would do for all the others. I just haven't done it on this file yet. So now my book is pretty much complete. Of course, from uh, aside from the hardest amount of work, which is writing the text um, to show your knowledge of the science concepts in your backyard and um, how you understand them and how they work together. But once you've done that, laying it into books, iBooks Author is pretty easy, pretty straightforward, and actually can look really professional when you're done. So a couple of things you're going to want to do before you finally hand in this project. You're going to want to definitely click on your um, book and preview it on an iPad. And you'll plug in an iPad with a sync cord, then click open up iBooks on the iPad, then click the preview button here, and you'll get to interact with it on an iPad without it being a final draft, just to see how things are going to work and make sure that everything transfers over to the iPad the way you thought it would when you designed it on your Mac. And then finally, when you're ready to, to hand it in to Mr. Morrow, this is where you'll either give him this iBooks author file, um, save it and name it, whatever you want it to, 
and um, submit it to his Dropbox as an IBA file, or he might ask for it as a .ibooks file. And in that case, you would click the Publish button. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you wouldn't use the Publish button. That's just to send it to the iBooks store. You instead would go to File, Export, and choose iBooks here, and then go through the next next screen, name it, put it where you can find it again, and then hand that into the Dropbox if he wants it as a .ibooks. So there's two file formats for a project. One is the iBooks author file, which you'll want to save it in and open it in each time you're working on it, because that's how you edit it. And the other is the .ibooks file, which is how you view it on an iPad. Um, I hope this helps you at least get started. Um, if you need any more help on iBooks author, you know where to find me. See you later.